So I am situated at the ESC of Central Ohio in Columbus um, through state support team um, for Region 11. And my information is on the PowerPoint. So any of the materials that we talk about today, if you need more information, um, feel free to reach out to me because um, I love connecting and helping. Just some background, I am a middle school person, so that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about me as a human, right? People who love middle school are a particular breed, aren't we? Um, so, right. Um, so when I, in particular, go into high schools to work, I feel like I have to put on at least my invisible armor to protect myself because it can be a challenging um, situation to explain the idea of disciplinary literacy because the thought is, oftentimes, and I think it's a huge misconception, that the expectation is that we want you to be a teacher of reading and that we want you to get a rocking chair and a nice fluffy rug and call kids up and read big books at the front. And that's actually not what literacy is. That's a little bit more of what literature is, and that lives in English language arts. But we would all be hard pressed to plan a lesson in the content area and remove all of the reading, writing, listening, speaking, viewing, and thinking and have anything left, right? So that's why literacy matters in the content area, but it is a tough conversation to have. So we have three goals, is understanding the concept of disciplinary literacy that's outlined in Ohio's plan and how it connects. Uh, to explore how knowledge is constructed within the disciplines and we'll focus on science and math today. And then to discuss a few practices that would help you implement disciplinary literacy. By the time we're done today, I will have shared several books, some podcasts, some online resources as well. So you should have lots of information to take back with you. Okay. Uh, I want you to take just a minute and I want you to write down your definition of disciplinary literacy. You can write a sentence, you can do some bulleted points, you can make a list, you could even draw a non-linguistic representation, but what is disciplinary literacy? Take just a moment to do that. So who wants to share? What is disciplinary literacy? I said that it's reading, writing, and speaking as a content expert would, like a story and scientist, mathematician. So reading all the literacy practices from the perspective of uh, an actual practitioner in the field of that content, good. Um, content specialist focused, um, connection between multiple disciplines, um, and really the ideal of getting kids uh, ready, using content uh, specialist material, mm -hmm. but having uh, kids being job ready, being able to communicate that uh, written, uh, and being able to understand the information and to, to go out and, and, and get a job. You could use uh, to boost the energy in the classroom. Like today, we're going to be a scientist today, yeah. and we're going to be a mathematician, or this is what a historian would do. So they could take the classroom materials and the classroom strategies and show how they're used by professionals. That's great. So leveraging the content to bring motivation and engagement. How many of you recognize that motivation and engagement are two huge issues that need addressed at the secondary level, right? So disciplinary literacy is definitely a tool um, that allows for that piece to come in. So I'm glad that you brought that up. That's a great observation. So you'll hear me mention a few different researchers today, um, but the, I'll call them the mother and father of disciplinary literacy, which is not an, a concept that is brand new, but it's certainly a concept that's been sort of rising to the surface in terms of the importance that it's playing. Um, are the Shanahans, and you know, Tim is here today, but his wife Cynthia has also done an awful lot of research around disciplinary literacy. Um, and in Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement, you'll see that our definition of disciplinary literacy um, comes from the words of Tim Shanahan. So I'm going to read this to you so we have this idea cemented in our thinking this morning. Disciplinary literacy moves beyond the common strategies used across all content areas and focuses on the unique strategies expert use, experts use to engage with text in an academic discipline. And I'm going to show you where you can find this to use in your own presentations in just a moment. But take a moment to think about that, how that definition jives with what you wrote and think about these three terms. This is what Cynthia says. She says that disciplinary literacy allows us to think about how each discipline creates, communicates, and evaluates information within the confines of its own um, framework of each discipline. So those are three big key words you can think about when it comes to disciplinary literacy. So you'll notice that I'm going to provide you an awful lot of opportunities to turn and talk today, and that's because one thing that we are hoping to share, a message we want to get across as we do our work across the state, is the importance of discourse 
Um, and something that we see and that research indicates is that at the secondary level, there are not ample opportunities for students um, to talk. Discourse doesn't happen often. A really easy thing, if you are there administrators or teacher leaders in the room? So an easy take back you can go back on Monday morning and do is to do a very simple walkthrough and keep a checklist of um, incidents of reading, writing, and discourse that you observe happening in the classroom. And that's a real easy way for you to take a temperature check of how literacy is rolling out in your secondary buildings. And on your list of things to do when you get back to your school setting, at the top of the list should be, if you haven't already, is to explore Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement. If you don't know, this plan was written a few years ago and was just recently revised. So in January of 2020, the new plan was put forward. Um, it follows the same theoretical framework um, that the first plan followed, but it has a more robust adolescent literacy section, and it also addresses writing. But what we know about Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement is that it's based on the simple view of reading, the theoretical model that really drives the work of literacy in Ohio. And what my colleague Roger and I uh, like to focus on um, with as many groups as we can uh, get to is that the simple view of reading is as critical at the secondary level as it is for the elementary. And we are probably much more um, ready to talk about the simple view of reading when it comes to those found students at that foundational level. But really when you think about it, um, we know that there are pervasive reading issues at the secondary level and they're tied directly to the simple view of reading. Um, and so if that is an area that you don't know a lot about, you can begin to build your knowledge just by reading Ohio's plan. Um, there are lots of um, information points that you would find interesting. So even from a secondary perspective, this is a powerful theoretical framework for us to be thinking about. So quickly, if you don't know what the simple view of reading is, it is a simple a multiplicative equation, right? So word recognition times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. And take a moment and put your mathematician hat on. And what do we know about a multiplicative uh, equation here? Whatever this is times whatever that is will give us our answer. So if we have anything other than a solid one in word recognition or language comprehension, what will that tell us about the eventual reading comprehension for any student? They won't be at their highest level of reading ability, right? So it's critical that students are able to develop their word recognition and their language comprehension skill. Because by the time they get to the secondary level, if there are deficits in these two areas, content, um, there becomes a barrier to learning content. And that's a guarantee. So if that is new learning for you, I would definitely suggest that you take a look at Ohio's plan because you would find some really interesting information in here. We have three components for adolescent literacy um, in Ohio. Um, the three components are strategic evidence-based practices across the content area. So that connects to content area literacy. And content area literacy uh, is that um, grouping of common strategies that you would see in any classroom, any time of the day, in any hallway of a school. They're very common um, strategies. So that's one component in Ohio's plan. The second is disciplinary literacy, so you can see that's where we got our definition from. And then the third is individualized intensive interventions by a trained reading specialist. So those are the three components of adolescent literacy in Ohio's plan, and disciplinary literacy is smack in the middle of it. So there's another um, benefit of learning about disciplinary literacy is that it aligns with the work that's being done by the State Department and it aligns with a, um, a lot of the initiatives that we're rolling forward, right, with disciplinary literacy. So this is a tool that would benefit you to use. You can also, if you're doing a presentation, literally cut and paste these definitions and use um, in your presentation. So that's something for you to think about. How many of you are familiar with Scarborough's Reading Rope? Something I want to draw your attention to is, is hopefully, if this is new to you, you'll see a connection because we have word recognition and language comprehension, those two concepts coming directly from the simple view of reading. Um, word recognition is made up of phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. And you'll notice something really interesting. I love to point this out about the rope. Look at the differences and the similarities between the rope. And what do you notice about the difference between the word recognition portion of the rope and the language comprehension portion of the rope. Turn and talk to your neighbor for just a minute and see if you notice it. And you may already know, so enlighten someone if you know the answer. So I'm hearing the answer percolating. What do you notice at the, as, as the, the difference there between the word recognition and the language comprehension? Who can share that with us? 
What's the difference? I'm going to pick on you because I heard the right answer. <laughs> I heard it. So, so the word recognition is braided, uh, symbolizing that it has to be much stronger. Right. If you, like me, are the mother of daughters, you've spent some of your lifetime braiding hair. And here's one thing I can tell you for sure about a good hair braid. A good hair braid starts and ends with all the hair doing the right thing at the right time. When you finish a braid and you then realize a big chunk has been left out, your braid either looks wonky when you try to shove it back in or you have to start all over again. It's an unsightly process, right? And that is why the braid is so significant. So imagine, I mean, you can picture in your head students who lack one of these three major skills. So if you lack phonological awareness, will your braid be strong? You'll have a strand of hair hanging out. The hair may need to be unbraided and rebraided, right? And really, if you just try to shove the braid back in, the, the piece of hair back in, the braid's not going to be as strong as it would have been if it was so strong from the beginning. So it's an important thing to remember about word recognition. Now, that is not to say, and this is a big argument that we hear uh, between sort of the science of reading and other friends in the educational field, that by the time students are at the secondary level doing remediation and intervention work around phonological awareness is useless. That's absolutely not true. There is great power and lots of resources and tools that can be used to help students strengthen their braid. But imagine if every student left third grade with a strong braid intact, what would that mean for our instruction at the secondary level? It's an amazing idea to think about, right? So then, move up to the language comprehension piece, and this is where I get really excited, excited about disciplinary literacy. Because you could take this rope, and this is actually an activity I do in my full day session. I will take out, uh, like keep, for example, background knowledge, but take out facts and concepts and leave that blank and have a group of math folks sit together and think about what background knowledge do you need to be successful in algebra? What do you need to know in advance? And what is one thing, if you're going to be successful in algebra, that you probably should know? Someone share. Variables. Variables. Okay, so there you go. So that could be something that would be listed. And we can do that for each of those components. Because guess what? Let's look at the second option there, vocabulary. Doesn't each content area have its own vocabulary? Think about tier one, tier, tier two, and tier three vocabulary. We know tier one vocabulary are those terms that sort of are general terms that you know because you're alive. Tier two words are academic terms that you're gonna learn across a learning experience. I think of them as like content area words, right? But tier three words are specific to the discipline. As a former English language arts teacher, a word I loved to teach was onomatopoeia. And unless you were on that one episode of Jeopardy where it was an answer and I was, my heart was you know, so happy and glad, you're probably not gonna need to know the definition of that too deeply into life, right? But for my poetry unit, it really did matter. And if I didn't teach that term, would students have learned it? Probably not, right? So you can use this idea of Scarborough's rope to help teachers think through uh, the vocabulary that's required for students to become, um, to apprentice into learning a specific discipline. And we can go down the rest of the list, but you get the idea, right? So you can actually, I would say that word recognition pieces stay consistent for all of the content areas, but we definitely could have conversations about how Scarborough's rope and the specifics around those components adjust based on the content area. So again, if this is new learning to you, this is a piece to put on your list for a to-do after um, you're done with these two days of learning, is to really dive deeply into this work with Scarborough's Rope. So one more piece I wanted to share with you that aligns with the work we're doing in Ohio is these evidence-based practices that you'd find in the IES practice guide. So remember I talked about doing a quick check where you could look for reading, writing, and discourse happening in a classroom. These are some components you can also look for. So if you wanted to make your walkthrough a little bit more robust. Um, and you can find this IES practice guide online with a lot more information around it. We don't have too much time to dive into it, but I wanted to share with you these components. So I wanna give you just a moment to read through the five. And I want to just charge you to keep these in the back of your mind as we continue to think about disciplinary literacy. So read through them and feel free to turn and talk at your table and we'll come back together in about two minutes. So the Shanahan's created this beautiful pyramid that we've used for a while describing the increasing specialization in literacy. So at the base of our pyramid we have basic literacy which would make up the foundational skills that you would think about the National Reading Panel talking about phonemic awareness 
phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And the idea that students should be learning from pre-K to hopefully third grade, really cementing those basic literacy skills. Then the Shanahan's move into a, a level of, above that, which is intermediate literacy. And that's where we start to think about things like advanced word study, decoding multisyllabic words, using fix-up strategies when you know your thinking is going awry um, when you're reading or trying to comprehend something. And then the final level is disciplinary literacy, where we really hone in on using all of those intermediate literacy skills, those general or common skills, to help us better understand content at that specialization level. So we've grappled with this pyramid for a long time, thinking that this pyramid makes it seem like you kind of jump from one level to another. But I don't know about you, but I know I graduated from the basic literacy level a long time ago, but I still think I vacillate between intermediate and disciplinary literacy depending on the content, depending on my background knowledge, depending on how new information is to me. And so we came upon a new graphic from a researcher who I'm quite fond of, uh, J.C. Ippolito, and this is one of the books that you'll see in the PowerPoint and we'll talk about today that I highly recommend. Um, and that is because he and his group came up with a, what I think is a better graphic that shows the interconnectedness between those three levels of literacy. So you'll notice that the basic literacy takes us in their graphic from kindergarten to about third grade. But where does disciplinary literacy start? Does it wait and start once we've mastered basic and intermediate literacy? No, you can see disciplinary literacy starts all the way in kindergarten too. Um, but what you would hear Tim Shanahan say is that as early as preschool, we can use a phrase that you used like, today, boys and girls, we're gonna be reading this book and let's start thinking like scientists. Let's explore this like a historian would. Let's pretend we're archeologists. What would we be looking for, right? So you can frame students' learning from that, specific, that specialization of the content area. You can also see you know, the intermediate literacy piece, again, begins in the kindergarten area and it doesn't go away once disciplinary literacy starts, but you can see that in the center section, um, there's a pretty good overlap of both, but um, intermediate literacy still has a pretty big role to play on its own. So I'm quite fond of this graphic because I think it does a really good job showing us that intermediate and disciplinary literacy sort of carry a student across their whole K-12 experience. They don't have a, a very staunch beginning and ending point other than kindergarten and 12th grade, right? So there's some variance in between the grade levels. This book, Disciplinary Literacy, Inquiry and Instruction, is a book I'm quite fond of, and that is because Ohio's plan honors both content area and disciplinary literacy, and I feel like this text does a really good job of doing the same thing. Um, one of my favorite things about the book is in the back there's an appendix, uh, appendix B, and it's a checklist. Are my students doing disciplinary literacy? And it gives you some great questions you can consider uh, around uh, several topics. So let me tell you, um, they are text, tasks, students, culture, and equity. And J.C. Ippolito is one of the first researchers that I've connected with who's really connecting disciplinary literacy to equity work, which excited me. Um, and it makes a lot of sense when you take a look at his checklist. So this is one um, carrot for you checking out this book later is to take a look at the appendix. The other piece that I love in this book is he has a chart on page 137 um, that says, what do we already have and know? And it has a, uh, several different categories of criteria where you can think about where are you with your learning around disciplinary literacy and perhaps where do you need to go. Um, I had an interesting conversation with an ODE colleague this morning who said, as a former social studies teacher, he said, as I'm learning more about disciplinary literacy, I realized I was doing some of this stuff, I just didn't realize it. And I said, that's the thing about disciplinary literacy and this is the importance of talking about in explicit instruction and knowing what you're doing and doing it for a specific purpose. And that comes from learning. So um, that's one thing I love about this chart is that it does honor that there are many content area teachers who are doing this work of disciplinary literacy. They just don't know it yet. So what a fun thing to bring to their attention. And Sally, I think that's one way that we um, can gently ease ourselves into the conversation is to acknowledge the good work that's already happening and this isn't an idea where we're adding something extra to your plate rather we're acknowledging what you're doing and then working on being more intentional and explicit about that kind of instruction. Alright so everyone has a handout so I would like for you to 
going to um, have you read just the first paragraph with a pen or pencil in hand. And what I want you to read, the purpose for your reading is to look for something that resonates with you that helps you understand the similarity or difference between content area and disciplinary literacy. So we're going to take four minutes. Margo's going to time us, give you four minutes, and read that first paragraph with a pen in your hand and see what you learn. Okay, so let's come back together. What observations do you have about the second passage or the chart? Anyone have wisdom to share? Bethany, thank you. One thing from this article I think is good to share with your science, social studies, and math teachers, the misconception that a lot of those teachers have when we start our book study with this is that we were asking them to become English teachers. And this article is very good to show them that's not what this is about. We're not asking you to do something. We're just taking it to a deeper level. Right. That's so. great. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by researcher Julie Meltzer, and she says, literacy isn't something extra on the plate. Literacy is the plate, right? And that is absolutely powerful. So we're not asking you really to do something extra. We may be asking you to drop some things that didn't have value. We may be asking you to rethink how you structure your class. We may be asking you to do more turn and talk and more collaborative conversation. But we're not asking you really to add anything that's uh, too novel and brand new. Rather, just use high quality strategies that we would expect in any classroom. Any other observations about the chart? I thought what this young man talked about that uh, to apply, and, and especially in math class, we can do a lot of things to learn the math, but how do I use it? How do I apply it? Uh, so I used in my classroom that the kids had to present to a board. They had a rich task, had to present to the board. And I said, the board isn't interested in if you multiplied or divided. Mm -hmm. The board is interested in for you to convince them that this is the right way to go because. Right. So that's a great segue. And Annika was not planted to say that. <laughs> but I do have some videos that we're going to take a look at in just a minute that shows us how to um, sort of how to apply these disciplinary skills into the classroom. Because it really is all about, I mean, the focus of disciplinary literacy, the end goal, is that we are apprenticing students into a discipline. It's that simple. So for my money, it makes disciplinary literacy easy to sell, right? Because if I'm a scientist, I should really want my children that I'm teaching to love science. And that's what disciplinary literacy does. Um, if you're new to disciplinary literacy, uh, Lent's book, Disciplinary Literacy in Action, is a must-have. She talks about what is a critical concept, which is creating a culture of literacy, of disciplinary literacy in a school. We're going to just fly over this slide, but this is something in our full day we would talk about more. And in Lent's book, you'll learn an awful lot about how to create this culture, because it's absolutely critical. And it's another step toward what Sally started us off with in thinking about how do we make that leap to convince content area teachers that they have a stake in this game and that this work will really value and benefit their, them in the end. And this chart kind of helps us get to that. But here is the funnel that I love to talk about, this idea of daily reading, writing, and discourse in every class every day. Um, you would be shocked, and maybe not, uh, to see how little these components really make up secondary classrooms. There's a lot of lecture that happens. There may be a lot of seat work time. Um, but this opportunity for collaborative conversation oftentimes doesn't exist. Rich text usage oftentimes doesn't exist. And writing, we all know about the landscape for writing, right? It it's, uh, has its challenges of its own. We could do a full day conversation on that. Um, but I will say this, that there's critical information research from a researcher named Nystrander in 2006. He went into middle school and high school classrooms, 50 period classrooms, and he timed how much, how many minutes of time students were able to engage in discourse with their peers. So the average time in a 50 minute uh, period that secondary students were allowed to engage in discourse, I want you to think about what time you think that would be. So a 50 minute chunk of time, how much time are students engaging in discourse? Turn and talk for a minute and see what you think. And I'm going to call on a couple people for your guess. Two or three minutes. Who else has a guess? I said five to eight. Five to eight. She's so, she's got just a good heart, doesn't she? Five to eight. That's so sweet. I love when people are like that in the room. What else? Give me one more guess. 
20 seconds. Annika, she's wrapping us up with a low estimate. The research indicates 14 to 52 seconds. 14 to 52 seconds in an average secondary classroom. So that tells us right there that we have a lot of room to grow when it comes to discourse. Now that doesn't mean in your particular building or in your classroom, hopefully we have standout stellar folks who go beyond that, and I believe that to be the truth, but that is a general statistic based on Nystrander's research. And from the time I've spent over the last few years in secondary buildings across the state of Ohio, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree. And here's the power of discourse. The power of discourse is, in my world, all good writing starts in talk. It starts in talk. So if talk isn't happening, and I just heard Doug Fisher say that all good writers are good readers, but not all readers are good writers, right? I just heard him say that, and I keep thinking about that, that these pieces are so interchangeably connected. So if you have an educator who's doing one part of this well, we gotta think about how to get the other two pieces up. This actually comes from the, from the research of Mike Schmoker. So if you've ever heard him talk or you've read the book Focus, this should sound familiar to you, right? Pay attention to the practices that lead to disciplinary literacy in this 10th grade chemistry classroom. So what's one thing that interests you about what you see? The final empirical formula is still C-U-C-L-2 times 2-H-2-O. So the initial mass is there. I want to give you a brief bit of information about a claim. A claim should be one or two sentences only, and it should be a statement about the results of your lab work, and it should answer the beginning question. If you ask students, what is this problem really about? They can't say. They can't make those connections easily. So the way I develop literacy skills in the classroom, I focus on claims, evidence, and reasoning. And the way I do that is through experiment. Today's lesson was based on what we did the previous lesson. Hey guys, take a note of what you should be doing right now on the board. Okay. Okay. The students heated up a hydrated salt to determine the empirical formula of it. The rest is like on the bottom. What makes their initial investigation slightly different than what's typically done is they were working off of a beginning question. Does the empirical formula of a hydrate depend on the initial mass? Instead of just doing the lab to verify results, the students will do an experiment, they will collect their data, and then they will make a claim based on that data. So all of the different groups look at the data, and from that data, they construct a claim. But first, they need to figure out what makes a good quality claim. On each lab bench, I have two claims, claim A and claim B. I want you to determine as a group which claim is the strong claim. This has a dependent and independent variable. Yeah. Yeah, because that's just, that's just like an observation. Yeah. Yeah. This is with temperature. And claim B is my product was a yellow solution. Claim A. Do you think B? I think it's, it's obviously A. It's not B. Yeah, I, I mean, think like, it's based a. on like the actual solution, it's like it went from, you know, like blue, like, like a blue green to like clear. This is like an observation. Yeah. Yeah. Like. So guys, make sure that you get these observations into your notebook because what we're doing here is we're developing evidence. And it's going to be the evidence that supports the claim that comes later in the class. He definitely encourages us to help each other. He wants us to ask other people in our group to make sure that we all understand it as a whole. What this one, it's saying if the temperature increases, the product claim. goes yellow. Like, can you yep. think of what the question like, oh, If it, because it's shorter, it would say, like, all the but, but, temperature but is see, lower. But see, that's the point. That's the point. Higher. That's what another thing that makes this one better, because reading this, you have a good idea what the beginning question is. True, yeah, well, yeah, Well, this, yeah. one, this one, you're just you're like, what? Kind of guessing. Yeah. And then the students were to construct their own quality claims about their lab. Does the empirical formula of the hydrate depend on the initial mass of the hydrate? Based on your observations, what can you claim about that? All right? I think the answer is no, the reason for that is because yeah. there's a number of different initial masses up there. Either way, the ratio is still true. Go ahead, Shema, tell us what you have. So we put the empirical formula of a hydrate does not depend on the initial mass. OK, great. So at this point, you've got your claims. Let's come back to the desk so we can look at that next part, the evidence. 
what are the characteristics of strong evidence? It includes supporting data. It explains the meaning behind the data. What do we think about the data? What is the data telling us about our beginning question and our claim? And one last question for five points. What does it depend on? If it doesn't depend on the mass, Carly, what does it depend on? The mole ratio. It depends on the mole ratio, guys. And guys, to wrap up, just summarize that. What does the empirical formula of the hydrate depend on? In science, you're mainly looking at the diagrams, graphs, tables, figures. They have to interpret those figures, graphs, and tables. Tell us, where is your evidence? Our evidence is the data chart. Okay. We use like the mathematical evidence. Tell me about your mathematical evidence real quick. So, like seven groups were given, every, every group was given a different initial mass, and six of the seven groups got the same mole to mole ratio, which gives us, which is two to one, which gives us the same empirical formula. Okay. And then they have to write in words what's happening. How do we express what we find in the lab to each other and to the world? He gives us a lot of information about how other scientists will portray their information in order for us to build our own developmental ways of writing like a scientist or a chemist. Is it accurate? How do we know it's accurate? Do we know it's accurate? No. I'd like to encourage you to pick up this tool from the Tennessee Department of Education, um, the Disciplinary Literacy Approaches tool. So you have those on in the center of your table and flipped to the second page where you'll see the discipline sciences listed. And I love this document for a few reasons and I want you to use it to think through what you just viewed, maybe the notes that you took, and take a moment to scan through the science um, pieces and you could think about the mathematics approach as well. Um, but the approach, you'll see some of the practices. So the practices would equate to the habits of mind or the specifications that you would need to apprentice into a discipline, vocabulary examples, and then most importantly, some additional resources you might look to to learn more about disciplinary literacy. So I wanna give you a few minutes to think about what you saw, talk about it, compare to what you're seeing in the chart, and think about how a, um, a district, a teacher could leverage disciplinary literacy to really work on conveying content to students. Because we know that that's, content is king, right? In, uh, particularly at the secondary level. So it's really about how do we convey content. So take a few minutes, turn and talk at your table. What did you learn from the video? What did you notice? And did anybody notice um, one of my favorite snippets about that is that I actually view content area literacy and disciplinary literacy on a continuum. I don't see them as a stark beginning and end. And he did a really good job of, uh, there was a, a place where this continuum was moving back and forth because what were the students actually writing? The end result was writing a summary, right, right? And we know that, summar that summarizing is a general strategy that you can use anywhere. But they were summarizing with what kind of content? Science content that requires certain things, like using evidence, using data, connecting it to your research, thinking about what your hypothesis was, right? So we take this general concept that can be used anywhere, but we put our disciplinary spin on it. And that's to me why this content area literacy and disciplinary literacy exists on a continuum, because we're always kind of moving back and forth between, right? Um, that's why for me the pyramid doesn't work so well, because it's not about one area or another, it's about this kind of like seamless moving back and forth between the two. So turn and talk about the observations that you had as you were watching that video. We as well talked about the video, but we talked about in how it incorporates that um, from the IES, that number two, direct and explicit instruction for comprehension, yeah. which goes into modeling, then guided practice, finally releasing kids for independent practice. Yeah. And that's exactly that far too often what we found with working with our striving reader grant teacher leaders was that we threw out a strategy, but without going back to that, it's not the strategy. It's making certain that students know how to use the strategy and what to do with it. And far too often we just presume that give it to them and they can run with it. And they can't. Yeah, and that doesn't happen. Uh, another piece of learning that we've taken away from the Striving Readers Grant is that within the gradual release that we don't offer enough opportunities for students to have some guided practice before they're expected to be independent practitioners, right? So that's another good piece of learning. So as you know, not all resources are 100%
filled with everything we need. And two, the savvy eye, any English language arts people in the room, you know what else is missing from here? There's no English language arts. And that's because oftentimes people don't think that English language arts is a discipline which is a whole nother conversation I will tackle this afternoon. But in the back of, in the, back of the Lent book, there's a whole appendix based on uh, disciplinary literacy practices for technology. So this would be a great place. And if you go to Corwin's site and just type in this name, the appendices are available for free. So you can see that entire resource. So, but that would be good feedback for Tennessee to think about expanding this list to include technology and English language arts. If you search learner.org, or just the phrase reading and writing in the disciplines, you're going to find this entire series of professional development on disciplinary literacy that you could use in your district, in your building, or just to build your own personal capacity um, that um, is organized in different segments um, and includes all four major, con the main content areas. So science, math, history, social studies, and English language arts. So if you just search that phrase, and you'll notice um, they have integrated this PD into Achieve, um, and so they've blended together at achieve.learner.org. So it looks a little different than the modules originally looked, but the content is all of the same and it's really high quality. So for the sake of our time today, um, we'll just, I'll just leave you with that. But the, there should be live links on your PowerPoint, and if you can't find it, you can email me and I can send you the direct link as well. Uh, reading and writing in the discipline. Mm -hmm. It should pop right up. So this is one of my big takeaways for you today, if you want to learn more, um, is to take a look at this, this site. So this is my 30-second chat with you all about writing in the disciplines. So there are specific um, areas that you can focus on in writing in the discipline, and you'll find um, this slide in your PowerPoint. If you want some additional information about the specificity around each discipline. You can also Google, and I can send you this as a link, but you can just Google it. Cynthia Shanahan wrote for ILA a resource called Disciplinary Literacy Strategies in the Content Areas, and it breaks down each of those pieces and talks a little bit about um, the writing piece. But this chart and more information about those writing practices comes from the Lent book. So I guess the big takeaway for you to think about is that within each content area, we have specific kinds of writing that should exist, but most importantly, we should be writing, right? And writing should include lots of feedback and opportunities for students to revise their work. I've got these few resources I've talked about. The one we didn't talk about was Ippolito's earlier book, Investigating Disciplinary Literacy, and this is a framework you might be interested in. Another resource to think about if you're, I love podcasts, so if you don't follow Amplify's podcast series, you must. Two podcasts ago was Shanahan talking about middle school reading issues. And within it, he does a really nice job of talking about disciplinary literacy. So it's another resource for you to listen to. It would be a great uh, resource to use within a small group of teachers to really think about and get them to explore the idea of disciplinary literacy. Here's my contact information. Um, I appreciate your attentiveness and your participation and all of those things. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much.